Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the Real Foot National Wildlife Refuge. Thank you, Zach, and welcome everyone to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our beautiful home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Zach, before I introduce today's very special guest, what is something you discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? Uh, This week, I discovered that the chamber exhibit opened in February of 2015, and the interesting thing was it was the first exhibit in the Discovery Center that was designed by, designed and built by park staff. There, and it was it was on uh, television. It was, it was actually I, all. It was on the History Channel's museum, man. I didn't I didn't have more info on that, so I didn't bring that part up. But yeah, no, I I, I know all about it. The <laughs> the History Channel was looking for a museum. They wanted to do, and I don't know. You're sitting on the other side of my computer screen, but you're also on my monitor, so that's why I keep looking over there. Our special guest is probably wondering why does he keep looking back behind his computer. Anyway, it was built. Um, the, the, uh, history channel called and said, Hey, we're looking for a museum who wants to let us work with them on building a really cool exhibit. And so they did, it was supposed to go up and then come down right away, but it turned out so well that they left it up and they kept meaning to take it down. And it's honestly, so many people love it. Um, it's really, um, it's really fun. One day, um, I walked out outside of my our office here, and a little girl was just walking around, and she had escaped from a birthday party up by the slide. <laughs> and I said, "Hey, could I help you?" And she said, "I heard there's a morgue down here. I want to <laughs> see it." And it was actually she was talking about the the chamber. So anyway, um, we have a very special guest today. We have Dr. Elaine Harris, who's a professor um, at the University of Tennessee in Martin. She's a professor of music. And she was recently inducted into the Steinway and Sons Teachers Hall of Fame, but also she has a fascinating career and has has done a lot for this area. And so we're looking forward to talking about a lot of things. So welcome um, to our podcast. Thank you so much. So so congratulations on your recent award. That's quite an accomplishment. Thank you. Take us back to uh, the very beginning and tell us a little bit about where you came from and um, uh, where you grew up and how you ended up here in our neck of the woods. I was born in Springfield, Tennessee, which is just a little bit north of Nashville. My father was a tobacco farmer and my mother a housewife. I went to school at George Peabody College for Teachers in Nashville, which is now a part of Vanderbilt University. And there I met my husband. Um, We continued and finished several degrees there and then moved to Monroe, Louisiana for his first job and then two years later moved to Martin. So I have been in West Tennessee since 1970. Um, I consider myself as close to being a native as possible of, of this area. And it was his job here that brought us to Martin. And I have been in Martin since then. And have done lots of different things in music. Now, when you grew up, uh, were your parents musical? To the point of singing in the church choir, and that was about it. Um, I I just thought playing the piano was wonderful fun, and my sister started lessons first, and she didn't enjoy it, and so I begged to, can I take, please? And uh, I got to take lessons, and it's been a part of my life since then. And now also, I mean, the piano uh, seems to take precedence in your in your bio and things, but also you're a great flautist. Is that how I say that? You play the flute? Uh, yes, I, uh, I no longer play the flute, but for many years I did and played principal flute in the Jackson, Tennessee Symphony and the Paducah, Kentucky Symphony. I'm, flute was just wonderful and getting all the orchestral experience is something most pianists do not have a chance to experience. But as life went on, keeping up two instruments became a little bit more than, than I wanted to do. So um, the, the flute was laid aside and I have maintained my um, piano life. Well, you, uh, the other thing is you can't play those two simultaneously. So you, you would not like the harmonica and the guitar. 
<laughs> no, no, you cannot play them at the same time. That is correct. <laughs> So um, you uh, began playing when you were a little girl. Did y'all have a piano in your house? Oh, yes, yes. A, a very old one, and it served admirably until I graduated from high school. Uh, and so you played all the way through high school? Yes, I started as a uh, seven-year-old and took lessons through high school and then continued in, in college and have just played all along. I tell my students I've played longer than your grandparents have been living. <laughs> so you um and I speaking of students I'm, I want to shout out to some that I assume you probably a couple that I assume and then one I know for sure Benjamin Beard and John Alex Warner yes. um I know you probably uh uh taught them uh at UT Martin and then Grant yes. Larkham I know yes. you and you and Grant um he 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 posted the nicest thing about you on uh Facebook I noticed the other day uh, for for folks who are listening who don't know, Grant has gone on to have quite a, a career in uh, music, uh, playing all over the country. He wrote, thank you, Dr. Elaine Harris, for all that you've done for me over the last nine years. It breaks my heart to know that our lessons are finally over, but I will carry what you have taught me for the rest of my life. How touching that was that he wrote that. Yes, it, it was. It, it warms a teacher's heart to, to feel that they have made a difference. And, you know, I, I tell many of these young men and young women that uh, I feel like their second or third grandmother, <laughs> more so than a teacher. Well, and I know um, all three of those young men have played uh, here at Discovery Park at one time or another, and they're all very, very talented. So thank you for contributing that. Um, what you've, you've had an, an illustrious long career. What do you think the, the, the impact is of young people learning the arts, you know, or music or things like that versus, you know, sports or, you know, some other kind of activities? The best thing for a, a young person is to experience different areas in their life. Um, it's been, you mentioned sports, and it's been shown that music helps a child in sports, and sports helps a child in music, so they are, are uh, mutually beneficial. But music can give a, um, a young person a way to express themselves emotionally, which isn't always something they can do easily. But the music can allow that with all of the expression you can put into it. Um, it also brings a lot of pleasure when you have a piece learned, you feel that you have really accomplished something. And it's, it's just a pleasure to sit down and play piano. And um, those who have practiced and who have learned find that it makes a difference in their life. Um, I think music is one of the areas that makes a person more human. That's great. Um, speaking of which, I know you began your career, your first teaching or one of your first, if not your first in Monroe, Louisiana. Yeah. Uh, you had a very unique experience. Tell us a little bit about, about that. Yes. Um, I was teaching in the public schools and this was in the late 60s when integration was starting and the schools were looking for teachers who would cross the boundary of black to white or white to black. And when asked if it would make any difference to me if I was put in a black school, I said, well, no, you know, I teach children, I don't teach a specific color. And so I was placed in an all black school. And at that time, um, the federal government had what was called Title V schools, and they were targeting schools with a high percentage of families who were not well off. And they were putting extra money into those schools to provide facilities and um, teaching tools, et cetera, to beef up these schools to help these students to achieve more in as a way to help break the cycle of poverty. And so this was one of those Title V schools. 
um, in Louisiana, there was still a lot of negativity toward integration and the school was firebombed. Um, not the whole school, but I was teaching in one of the outbuildings and that was firebombed. And it was rather <laughs> unusual to walk in the next morning and find that your room had some evidence of a fire. Um, so we just went right on and taught as if nothing had happened. But that was an experience I won't forget. May that never be repeated in this country. Absolutely. Um, do, did you find that um, probably a lot of these young people had never had anyone teach them the piano before? This was probably uh, new, I'm guessing. In any yeah. school, probably a lot of the little kids that you teach, you know, did you see any take to it naturally or uh, any interesting stories came out of that with the students? Well, I was not teaching piano lessons. I was hired as a classroom music teacher. Okay. So I was teaching what they call general music to grades seven through 12. And yes, I would find some students who could do very well with the listening and with understanding what the music was doing. This was not a required course, but um, I will have to tell you that when someone needed something to put in their schedule. They sent the students to me. So <laughs> I had a rather motley group, but we did very well. Um, the hardest thing was that I didn't have the materials I needed. I had a piano and a record player and a film projector, but I had no music, no films and no records. Wow. So whatever I needed, I would check out of a library somewhere or borrow from someone else or take from home so that I could have the things that I needed for the students. Wow. That's, uh, that's an amazing story. That almost sounds like a movie. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, that's really interesting. How long, how long did you uh, do that? Um, I had the job for a year and then my husband and I moved to Martin after that. Year. And what, uh, what uh, area of study was he? He was a musicologist, also a, a music teacher. And musicology is the area of music history and literature. So um, I called him the professor with a book. <laughs> so you, you guys were quite the um, couple when it comes to music. Um, you could take over a dinner party. <laughs> well, just about. Um, his interest in me started when he needed an accompanist. <laughs> that's great he just so he, married his i was just so gonna he, say yeah so he just married one so he always had one after that yes. um so i i noticed you also have spent a lot of time working uh in i think it's called kinder music um yes where, where you immediately get little kids um and zach here has how old are your kids now zach they're little uh my son will be two this month and my daughter or next month. And that is not too young, according to what I read about kinder music. Tell us a little bit about that. Oh, kinder music was a large part of my life for um, 18 to 20 years. And I was interested in music education to begin with. That was my, that was the area of my degrees. And kinder music was um, set up to put music back in the lives of children. We find so often that it, today that children are not singing, their parents are not singing, and they don't know many of the uh, folk tunes of our country that you and I would know automatically. So kinder music set about putting music in the life of the home. So most of my classes had young children and as you know birth to age seven coming to class with their parents because you wanted to teach the songs to the children and to the parents so that they would sing with them uh, and you wanted to model for the parents activities they could do that would help the child to develop musically but it wasn't so much an effort to turn children into musicians it was more an effort to help these children develop in all ways possible through music. So we would do um, 
a lot of movement in different ways. You would study what each age child should be able to do and what skills they were working to develop. And then you would work that into your music class. You knew what sorts of things they needed to do to improve speech. And so you would put that in your class. Um, you would set up chances for a child to be creative. You can't teach someone to be creative, but you can set the stage for it and then you let them go. Um, I remember giving children rhythm sticks and saying, well, and, and indicating how they were to use them as we played along. And then I'd say, find some other way to make sounds with these. And sometimes I was amazed with what they could come up with because I hadn't thought of it. And there is a chance for a child to come up with his own idea. And then you praise him, look what you have discovered. And that encourages a child to continue to be creative. And do they so, and, and do they still offer? I know you were part of the program in Martin. I don't know if you still are or not, but is that still something that's available? Uh, is, is the kinder care program, kinder music program, still in Martin? No, it's not. There aren't any kinder music classes in Martin. There are some classes for young children, but not not many. And, and there was and, kinder music in in Union City too. So you've been you've been here since 1970, a long, long time. Um, uh, you know, what do you see as the the challenges for someone living in a rural community who is a champion of the arts like you are? I work very hard to bring music to everyone in a way that they can all enjoy it. I have done some piano programs that were not just <laughs> what some people would call hoity-toity classical music, shall we say. Um this past fall, a colleague in McKenzie, Keith Harris, a very fine pianist, and I presented Gustav Holt's The Planets, which is written for two pianos. And he was, the composer was attempting to represent the planets through music. This was in the early 1900s. So he was one of the first people to, one of the first composers to bring to attempt to portray outer space in his music. Of course, we see that all the time with Star Wars and Star Trek and with anything that has to do with outer space. But as we did the music, which is really wonderful to listen to, uh, there were slides of the planets from current um, NASA probes showing what the planets look like along with the deities that have the same names. So there would be um, a picture of Venus, the planet, and then a picture of Venus, the goddess. So that extra visual engaged the audience much more than if it had just been the music. So that's the sort of thing I try to do with the public. And every time there is a recital that I'm a part of, I want to talk to the audience first and say, let me tell you what this composer did. Let me tell you why he wrote this music. And then the stage is set for them to listen. Um, I, and other things, I, I am very active in, in organizations that help with music, the Martin Area Music Teachers Association and the local music club. Music is for everybody. There's always something that someone likes. So that's a great lead in to, so for someone like Zach, you know, who has little kids, what are some things that you recommend to parents? Maybe they don't have access to uh, get to a music class, or maybe they can't at this time get their kid into lessons, you know, no matter, no matter how young they are, what are some of the things that you recommend that they try to incorporate into their family life to benefit kids with music? A lot of listening. There are many good um, CDs or sources of music for children to listen to and just have it in the background. You don't have to sit and stare at the CD player while you're listening to music, but just having it going while the child is around in the room and then experiencing things that make sound. Notice how young children love to pull the pots and pans out of the cabinets and take a spoon and beat on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
they're experimenting. What kind of sound does it make when I hit this way? What kind of sound does it make when I hit something else? It's that sort of free play with ordinary objects or with childhood instruments that you can buy. Just lots of listening and children do what their parents do. So if the parents will sing along with them on the songs the parents know, the kids will think, oh, this is cool. I'm singing with mom or I'm singing with dad. That one-on-one -on -one interaction is just superb. Yeah, I, I worry that uh, with more and more of these phones and <laughs> now they have the new, you know, the thing you put over your face, we continue to separate family members from each other um, and lose some of that interactivity. I'm hoping that soon the pendulum will swing the other way and people will spend as much time as possible with their kids. Yes, yes. That one-on-one -on -one contact is very important. Um, I have often said that when a parent is rocking a child, that is some of the most valuable time possible because the child is physically connected to the parent. And if they're rocking, we musicians know it helps to develop a steady beat. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So Excellent. rock those kids. <laughs> well, um, we're going to go to a break in just a minute and we're going to talk about your award. But first, I want to talk about, I know that you're a mother and a grandmother and tell us a little bit about your family. Um, my husband, my late husband and I had two sons and neither one of them are active, active in music as a profession but they still listen to music. I remember one saying, I've got to get my car fixed. I can't do without my music. And uh, the other one had, who had done a, a lot of study, um, picked up a, the Claire de Lune again and relearned it and recorded it as a way for scholarship money for students who wanted to do programs with um, having to do with outer space. He's the son that works for SpaceX and the other son does computer animation. So yes, they are still interested in music. And although they don't live close by, the only thing grandmama can do is pay for the piano lessons, which she does. And I know you have some grandchildren as well, right? Yes, I have four and one on the way. Oh, congratulations. Yes. Um, yes. Side note, I have a friend, Sonia, who works um, at SpaceX. So oh. I'll have to find out if they know each other. Is um, she in Florida? Uh, I believe she she is uh, not in Florida. She's she works out of D.C. Oh. Um, so I'll have to we'll have to see if they know each other. And so let's take a really quick break, and when we get back, we're going to talk about your award um, and how you got nominated and all that. So Thank you. we'll be right back. The Real Foot National Wildlife Refuge was established about 15 miles southwest of Discovery Park to manage the upper third of Real Foot Lake as a refuge for migratory birds. There you'll find a wintering ground of waterfowl and bald eagles. They host multiple activities throughout the spring, summer, and fall, including the annual Youth Fishing Rodeo Junior Ranger Camp. Various workshops, archery programs, guided canoe trips, eagle tours, and more. For their complete schedule, Google Real Foot National Wildlife Refuge. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. So uh, welcome back, everybody. We're here with Dr. Elaine Harris, uh, a recent winner um, of the uh, Steinway. Let's see. I, I got to find the right, the right way to say this. You are... Um, inducted into the Steinway and Sons Teachers Hall of Fame. So congratulations on that. Um, you were nominated by a, a Memphis company, Amro Music. I'm from Memphis, and um, I've bought about four or five uh, violins from Amro Music through the years. Um, my mother-in-law passed away about five years ago, and uh, her piano was... Uh, very valuable for the family. It wasn't necessary. It wasn't a Steinway. It wasn't necessarily valuable, but we ended up storing it at Amro Music 
um, for the last five years. And finally it's at one, one of our friend's houses, but, um, anyway, so, uh, that was really awesome that AMRO nominated you. Tell us a little bit about the prize and the experience of, of going to the event. Well, it, it was a surprise to me when I got the phone call that said, you have been nominated and you have been selected and you will have the opportunity to go to New York in October for this award. So um, I did go in October with my, my younger sister, who is also a musician. And uh, we went to the um, event, which was a big dinner with presentations and all the other folks who had been nominated this year. They do this every two years. Um, and it was a lovely dinner and you got the plaque and so forth. And it just felt, I, I felt very honored. So often the, um, it's the performer who gets the attention and rightly so. And there are those of us who teach and consider our teaching to be number one for us. And having a teacher recognition is just, gives you a big head. I've had to go and try <laughs> to get my head back down because um, I, I, I was just so honored that they thought the things I did as a teacher were warranted this nationwide award. Um, not only do I teach piano, but I am very active in music organizations in this area and in the state. And I work with young children and uh, in a piano camp in the summer. And I also work with pre-college students for a piano competition. So there are lots of educational things I do in addition to the standard teaching lessons. And I think it may have been the realization of um, the width of the activities I do that were an influence in this award. And as I say, I was just absolutely thrilled. Um, I don't think I'd gotten an award like that before. Well, and um, how did you rise to the attention of AMRO Music in Memphis? Do you work with them um, at all? Um, yes, we are. Uh, UTM is an all Steinway school. And our source for the Steinways would have been, it is um, AMRO. So we bought all the Steinways we needed to make it an all Steinway school from them. So I worked directly with the Steinway representative and I talked to him every three, two or three months and he's on my mailing list of activities that I do. So he knows all the things that are going on in Martin and at UTM for pianists. Well, that's that's amazing. Well, I'm I'm I love history, and so I was really curious about Steinway once we started talking. Um, and for anyone out there who's like me who doesn't really know anything about the company, um, it began in 1836 when Heinrich Engelhard Steinway built his first piano in the kitchen of his home in Germany. Um, and then in he he migrated to the United States, and on March 5th, 1853 founded his company Steinway and Sons. Um, he set up shop on Varick Street on the west side of Manhattan and began manufacturing uh, pianos. And today, 97% of concert soloists choose to play on a Steinway piano. So that's in and, and places like UT Martin are all Steinway. Um, just ballpark. I was I was looking like I'm not in the market for a piano, but they're not, they're not inexpensive. Um, what's the ballpark figure for a, for a really good Steinway piano now? If you are looking for um, an upright, the, a Steinway upright, I would expect it to be, run about 30,000 now. And then if you are looking for a grand piano and, um, the seven foot is typically the the one you would want to have. But now, Joe Blow is not going to go buy a seven foot Steinway. Someone who's really interested in piano would. Those are running about 90,000 now. Uh, so they're very expensive. 
But is that, can you tell a difference if when you sit down to play a Steinway, does it feel different than playing just the, the piano that we have here at Discovery Park in our Tennessee room? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Big difference. And an, another important aspect is its longevity. Um, UTM has Steinways that were bought, uh, all of the grands that we bought were Steinways in 1970, and the uprights were Baldwin. Hmm. Those Steinways that we bought in 1970 are now 50 years old, 50 plus. And when they got to about 30 years old, around 2000, 2005, after about 35 years, they were showing wear. Um, and I don't mean um, how they looked. I mean how they played, how they functioned. So you take the Steinway and you send it in and you get it rebuilt. And then it's just like having a new one again. Now, rebuilding is not inexpensive, but it's a whole lot less than buying a new one. Imagine having a really good car, having a Rolls Royce and running it for 35 years. It's going to need something. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you have it rebuilt and you probably got it for another 35 you buy the quality and you can keep it for much much longer than if you buy um something that is more cheaply made or uh, shall we say not made with quite the craftsmanship i've toured the steinway factory twice and i have seen the people who make the instruments working and I have seen what they do to check things and how they do so much of it by hand and how they shape the body of the grand pianos and so forth. And many of these people have been working there all their life. And it's almost a, a hand it down to a son. It, it's more like an apprenticeship, but um, they are expensive, but Again, it's the quality. If you can get that, it will last you so very long. Now you can go out and buy something for $3,000, but you'll only get $3,000 worth out of it. Sure. No, that makes sense. I bet it was fun getting to tour the, the factory and see exactly how they're made. It was. Um, to watch some of the things they would do and to hear, now this has to sit in this place nine months before it is ready to before that wood is ready to be used for something. So it's a long process. It takes um, a year from beginning to end for a piano to be made. And it doesn't mean they work on it every day for a year, but some things have to be done and then others must be done and it must sit that way for so long before you go on and do the next thing. Yeah, for about 15 seconds, I worked for Aeolian Piano Company in Memphis. Okay. Um, and I worked in marketing, and I would have to go out into the warehouse every once in a while. And I can just, us talking about it, I can smell that smell that the where, where they manufactured the pianos had us, I guess it was the glue and the varnish and the, you know, it had a certain smell to it. So um, it's really interesting. So I have one more question before we go. Um, when you sit down just, to play the piano for fun, what is your favorite thing to play? Oh, a good question. I'll give you several names. Um, Debussy's Claire de Lune, Bach's Prelude in C major, uh, maybe a Mozart sonata, a slow Scarlatti sonata, a Chopin posthumous prelude. These are some things that are really very beautiful and that allow you to relax and to turn your mind and your emotions and your thoughts away from the everyday busyness of life. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, um, I can't thank you enough for all you do for our community um, for our friends who are musicians and for, you know, all the, the work that you've done, you know, since moving here in 1970, it's a greatly appreciated by all of us. So thank you. You are welcome. It's a pleasure to be here.
And thank you to all you listeners who joined Dr. Harris, Zach, and me today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. Boom. Thank you so much. Um, oh. You know, I don't know if you know this or not, but my wife works at UT Martin. Um, her name's Michelle Williams, and she teaches art history. So, Oh, she's in the same building I am. Yeah, yeah. She's... Um, <laughs> yeah, see if you can find see if you can find Michelle Williams um, over there in the art department. She's uh, she's this is her first year to teach full time. Um, she's taught part time for a while. You know, we moved here from Washington D.C. and she's an art historian, so uh, she was working there part time. But she's finally bit the bullet and jumped in, and uh, it's uh, we're we're uh, she's really loving it. So it adds a lot having folks like you around that she gets to gets to know really well. So oh, that's great. That's good. Well, thank you. We'll let you know when this uh, comes out. Uh, it'll probably be what, Zach, two, three weeks? Probably about two or three. Yes. Two or three weeks, um, but we'll send you an email and let you know. Well, I'm honored to have been asked. Thank you so much. Oh, you're so welcome. And I'll see. Let me know if I can ever do anything here at Discovery Park for you. I sure will. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.